Hello and welcome to Japan Media Tour. I'm your host, Stephen TM, and today we're going to be talking about Pokemon, specifically the Generation 1 Game Boy games. I'll touch on the anime and the cards as well, but I think the games really are the heart and soul of the Pokemon franchise, which is the highest grossing franchise of all time, beating out the likes of Mickey Mouse, Hello Kitty, Star Wars, and Harry Potter. It's clear that Pokemon has a major role to play in our examination of the most important works of Japanese art and media. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the world of Pokemon, and many of you will have played the Gen 1 games before, but I'll still give a basic rundown for both nostalgic and educational purposes. So where did it all begin? Pokemon was created by Satoshi Tajiri. As a child growing up in Machida, Tokyo, he was obsessed with catching bugs and other small creatures. So much so that his friends even called him Dr. Bug. Throughout the games, you run into a lot of trainers referred to as bug catchers. And I think knowing that the creator was such an avid collector of insects kind of gives me a new appreciation for those guys. So Tajiri's vision of Pokemon was all about capturing the feeling of going outside and exploring the world. He saw how urbanization had taken over his hometown. A place that was once full of parks and grassland was now a concrete nightmare. That might be a bit harsh, actually. I don't believe I've been to Machida, but it looks like a pretty nice place to me. Anyway, he wanted to enable kids who grew up in the city to experience the wonder of exploring nature the way he did in his youth. A noble cause, if ever there was one. And Tajiri always possessed an entrepreneurial spirit, starting his own arcade gaming magazine called Game Freak in the 1980s. It was essentially a handmade guidebook with tips and tricks for beating arcade games. Soon after starting the self-published magazine, Tajiri was joined by Ken Sugimori, who took over the illustration side of things. Game Freak eventually evolved into a video game development company in 1989, led by the three-headed hydra of Tajiri, Sugimori, and composer and developer Junichi Masuda. Masuda composed a lot of the classic Pokemon music. I didn't realize how great the music was at the time. It's pretty simple, but it's super nostalgic to me now. Game Freak made a few different games for Nintendo and Sega, but in 1996, they really broke through with their smash hit Game Boy releases, Pocket Monsters Red and Green. They were only released in Japan, and it would take another two years for the rest of the world to embark on their very own Pokemon journeys. Yes, Pokemon is a portmanteau of pocket monsters, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Japan loves portmanteaus, and there are many others in the world of gaming, such as Sumabura, which is what they call Smash Brothers. Now, you might be wondering why Pokemon Red and Green were released at the same time. Well, they're pretty much the same game with only a few small differences, most notably the 11 version-specific Pokémon that are available in each. Those exclusive to Red include Growlithe, Mankey, Oddish, and Ekans. And in Blue, you can catch Sandshrew, Vulpix, Bellsprout, and Meowth, among others. The reason for these exclusive Pokémon was to encourage players to trade with their friends or for kids to ask their parents to buy them both versions of the game. It was pretty genius um, as a marketing move, and apparently it was Shigeru Miyamoto of Mario and Zelda fame who came up with the idea. And here's a little fun fact for you. In the Japanese version of the anime, the main character Ash is called Satoshi, after Satoshi Tajiri, and his rival Gary is called Shigeru, after Shigeru Miyamoto. But more on the anime later. The Pokeballs you used to capture Pokemon were inspired by the Gachapon capsules that are ubiquitous throughout Japan. For those unfamiliar, you put some money in a machine, turn a dial, and out comes a little ball or capsule with a toy inside. The name Gachapon is actually made up of two onomatopoeia. Gacha being the sound of the dial turning, and Pon being the sound of the plastic ball dropping out of the machine and into the collection tray. Japan loves portmanteaus and onomatopoeia. The capsule kaiju from the Ultraman series was another source of inspiration for the Pokeball. And actually, Pokemon was originally called Capsule Monsters. Capsule kaiju are thrown into battle to spawn monsters. 
Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Anyway, Game Freak changed the name of the game from Capsule Monsters to Pocket Monsters in order to avoid any trademark issues. The name Pocket Monsters also emphasized the portable nature of the Game Boy, the system with which the development of the game was inextricably tied. In the City Pop episode, I talked about how Sony's Walkman changed music forever. Well, Nintendo's Game Boy did pretty much the same thing for video games. The influence of these two devices also resonated strongly with Steve Jobs and played a significant role in shaping the design of the iPhone, which in turn inspired elements of Nintendo Wii's design. Game Boy sales were actually in decline in the mid-90s. Little did anyone know that Pokemon would be the game that brought handheld gaming back. The fact that the game was on a handheld device brought a social aspect to Pokemon that was usually reserved for multiplayer games like Mario Kart. I remember when I was a kid, everyone would bring their Game Boys to school and play Pokemon, trading with the link cable and sharing tips like how to evolve Weepin' Bell or where to catch an Electabuzz. It got to the point where we'd all be playing Pokemon instead of running around playing sports or tag. I'm pretty sure Game Boys ended up getting banned from our school, along with Crazy Bones and Beyblades and everything else kids liked. I really don't think we thought about it at the time, but Pokemon was the introduction to RPGs for a lot of kids. Well, really it was kind of a role-playing game for people who don't normally play RPGs. For a lot of people, this is probably the only RPG they ever played in their lives, which is kind of sad, but also kind of cool in a way. As long as everyone plays at least one, then I'm happy. RPGs are time-consuming and can be slow to get through, but that's what makes them good, and I'm glad Pokemon gave so many people a little taste of this. Training Pokemon teaches patience, and even though the strategy is pretty simple, there's a lot of reading to do and a lot of things to remember, so it was probably pretty good for our development, I would say. And Tajiri was obviously a master of world building, just like J.R.R. Tolkien or J.K. Rowling. All the different Pokemon and the types and the moves and the lore that was created, I think Pokemon is often kind of overlooked here. I guess I should mention that the Final Fantasy Legend, which is often credited as being the first RPG for Game Boy, was another early influence on Pokemon. The Final Fantasy Legend, released in 1989, was not actually part of the main Final Fantasy series, but was marketed as such for its international release in order to capitalize off an established name in the world of gaming. It's pretty similar to Final Fantasy and Pokemon in that it's a turn-based RPG where you do battle with different monsters. So, as I mentioned, Pokemon Red and Green were released in Japan in 1996, and by 1997, they were the best-selling games in Japan. Pokemon Blue came out shortly after the original two. It was essentially the same game, but with some new sprites, and they also fixed a few glitches. It was still full of strange and interesting glitches, though, as were most games from that era. Um, the red and blue versions of Pokemon released internationally in 1998 were based off of the Japanese Pokemon Blue. The international red version, of course, had the same version-specific Pokemon as the Japanese red, and the international blue had the version-specific Pokemon from the Japanese green. Following in the footsteps of their Japanese counterparts, Pokemon Red and Blue were the highest-selling games in the U.S. by 1999, and the first-generation Pokemon games have sold over 31 million copies worldwide. I remember when I first got Pokemon for Christmas. I'd been seeing the commercials on TV for a while, and I thought the little monsters looked so cool. Ken Sugimori's art style resonated with me instantly. I got the blue version, and I chose Squirtle as my first ever Pokemon. I remember making the rookie mistake of training my Squirtle way too much and kind of ignoring the rest of my squad. Um, so let's get into the gameplay a little bit. It all starts with your neighbor, Professor Oak, telling you all about the world of Pokemon. After this opening monologue from the professor, you find yourself in your room. I always liked that the main character has a Super Nintendo in his room. Maybe because I had one in my room as well. Maybe because it was kind of like a link from the real world to the world of Pokemon. When Oak is giving you his opening speech, you see your character standing there, large and realistic looking. 
and after he's finished, you see him getting shrunk down and placed into the context of the game. This is subtle, but it's a beautiful way of pulling the player directly into the game, into the world of Pokemon. By the way, the main character in the original Pokemon games is called Red. Ash from the anime is loosely based off Red, and his rival Gary is based off Blue. I think I'll just use the anime names for the rest of this episode, though, as it, it might be confusing using Red and Blue for both the names of the characters and the games. So as you're heading out the door, your mom says, All boys leave home someday. It said so on TV. This is actually a really good line. It adds some weight to the storyline. You're about to leave your family behind and go on an adventure all on your own. But it's also a bit funny that she's quoting it from the TV and not from her previous life experience or something. It sounds wise and profound, but it just came from the television. Pokemon isn't known for its dialogue like, say, Earthbound is, but there are some underrated lines in there for sure. It's also kind of similar to Earthbound in that you never meet the main character's father. In Earthbound, you actually speak to your dad on the phone, but in Pokemon, there's no sign of him, as is the case in lots of games and anime. I think the less parents are involved, the more freedom it feels like the character has. And a lot of these games are buildings roman, or coming-of-age stories. Without his father there, it's necessary for Ash to become a man. So after you leave home, you walk into the tall grass where Professor Oak tells you not to venture out without a Pokemon to protect you. He brings you and your rival, Blue or Gary, to his lab and allows each of you to pick a Pokemon to accompany you on your journey. The choices are Bulbasaur, a grass-type Pokemon, Charmander, a fire-type, and Squirtle, a water-type. Whichever one you choose, your rival Gary will choose the one which has a type advantage against you. For example, if you choose fire, he'll choose water. You do battle with Gary right away, as you will many times over the course of the game. After this, you're free to leave Pallet Town, which is supposedly based off Satoshi Tajiri's hometown of Machida. The Generation 1 games in general are set in the Kanto region, which is a real area in East Japan, where you'll find cities like Tokyo and Yokohama. The game uses fictional cities, though, some based off real places. I've heard that Pewter City is based on Mayabashi in Gunma Prefecture, which is home to Mount Takagi, the inspiration for Mount Moon in the Pokemon games. So you really have two goals in the game, to defeat the Elite Four and become the Pokemon Champion, and to collect all 150 Pokemon and complete the Pokedex. Well, 151 Pokemon, including Mew. The Pokedex is a device that keeps a record of all the Pokemon you see and all the ones you collect. It also gives you a little description of each Pokemon, which helps to immerse you into the Pokemon universe and teach you some of the lore there within. It gives the Pokemon some personality, too. I'll give you a little taste of these Pokedex entries. Goldux says, Often seen swimming elegantly by lake shores. It is often mistaken for the Japanese monster Kappa. This is a really cool one as it connects the game with Japanese yokai, which are kind of mythological creatures in Japan. I made an episode about yokai a few weeks ago if you want to learn more about them and their connection to modern Japanese media. San Shrew's entry says, Burrows deep underground in arid locations far from water. It only emerges to hunt for food. This is actually useful. It hints at the fact that San Shrew a ground-type Pokémon, is susceptible to water-type attacks. Now, everyone who played the game wanted to be a Pokémon master, so you had to know the lore to some degree. We all wanted to know more than our friends about the characters and about the intricacies of the game. And there actually is a lot to know. What level certain Pokémon evolve at, which moves they learn, what types are effective against others... You can learn a lot from talking to characters in the game, which is at the heart of all good RPGs. You could also buy guidebooks and things like that, or watch the anime. The creators of Pokemon masterfully crafted an entire ecosystem that took the world by storm. So your initial stated goal in the game is to complete the Pokedex. So you're basically searching through the tall grass, looking for as many different Pokemon as you can find. 
I still remember coming across a Pikachu for the first time in Viridian Forest. I don't think I'd really seen the anime at that point, so Pikachu wasn't really on my radar yet. But I just thought the character design was so cool, and he's also the first Pokemon that has an interesting attack, Thundershock. But up until then, the other Pokemon mostly just used normal type moves like Scratch or Tackle, so it's cool when you encounter this electric type. Pikachus are pretty rare too, there's only a 5% chance of encountering one in Viridian Forest, so it feels special when you come across one. Viridian Forest is also where you encounter Bug-type Pokémon for the first time. These are fun to catch and train for a while because they evolve so quickly. Caterpie evolves into Metapod at level 7, which then evolves into Butterfree at level 10. Compare this to Charmander, which becomes Charmeleon at level 16, and Charizard at level 36. And you can see that the payoff comes a lot sooner with bug types, at least the ones you find early in the game. This makes bugs the perfect Pokemon to use at the first couple gyms, and then replace them with something stronger later on. A little note here for anyone who's never played the games before, you can only take a maximum of six Pokemon with you into battle at one time, so most people will change their lineup as the game goes on to try out new and perhaps more powerful Pokemon. So back to the topic of evolution, let's look at a few other cool and unique ones. When I mention evolution, my mind goes right to Eevee, which has become one of the mascots of the franchise, along with Pikachu, the starters, and Jigglypuff. In Generation 1, Eevee can evolve into one of three different Pokemon, Jolteon, the electric type, Vaporeon, the water type, and Flareon, the fire type. Most people say Jolteon is the best in battle, but honestly, the game isn't all that hard, so I usually just pick the Pokemon I like the most based on their character design or their moveset. In order to evolve Eevee into one of these Pokemon, you need to expose it to elemental stones, corresponding to one of the three types, thunder, water, or fire. One of the most interesting items you find early in the game is actually the Moonstone, which can be used to evolve Pokémon such as Clefairy and the aforementioned Jigglypuff. The first time you use a Moonstone is another rite of passage in the game, along with getting your first gym badge and catching your first Pokémon. It feels like kind of a magical item, and opens up new possibilities in the game. Gyarados is another interesting evolution. You need to train a Magikarp, the most useless Pokemon in the entire game, to level 20 in order to evolve it into Gyarados, which is one of the strongest and coolest Pokemon in the game. I always have a tough time deciding which water-type Pokemon I want to train. There are too many good ones. Gyarados, Vaporeon, Lapras, the list goes on and on. You can also evolve certain Pokemon by trading them. Some of these ones are really cool, but for some reason I never used them much. I, I guess it was just a bit of a hassle to do so. This is how you get Gengar and Alakazam, which are two of the coolest and strongest Pokemon in the game. Alakazam is amazing in Gen 1 due to his high speed and special stats, which were absolutely crucial in Red and Blue. See, the speed stat was tied to the likelihood of critical hits, so the faster the Pokemon was, the more damage it was likely to do in battle. There was also only one stat for special in Generation 1, which covered both special attack and special defense, so if your Pokemon had high special, it was pretty much a beast. But these are things I never even thought about when I was a kid, and they only really matter if you're battling with your friends via link cable or playing Pokemon Stadium. Now let's get into the art style a little bit. Pokemon has some of the best character design I've ever seen, and it's certainly been a huge influence on me as an artist. A lot of the characters I draw end up looking a bit like Pikachu or Eevee. Ken Sugimori was the lead artist, but Atsuko Nishida actually came up with the designs for Pikachu and the three starters, as well as several other Pokemon. Sugimori finalized all the designs, though. And his watercolor paintings are incredible. Go check those out if you haven't seen them. He's an absolute master at using white space in his works. So apparently the first three Pokemon that were created were Clefairy, Lapras, and Rhydon, which I find surprising. Uh, pretty much every character is well designed in Generation 1 as well. 
uh, something that probably can't be said for the later versions. Um, there were actually hundreds of Pokemon drawn for the original game, but many of them were scrapped at various stages of development. You can find some of them online. It's uh, pretty interesting to go through the sprite art and imagine what could have been. So I mentioned Mount Moon earlier, which is where you find a moonstone. And it's also where you first encounter Team Rocket, the organized crime syndicate that uses Pokemon for evil rather than good. They steal Pokemon and conduct experiments on them. So you got to show them what's what now and again. They're in the caves of Mount Moon looking for rare Pokemon fossils, namely the Helix and Dome fossils, which turn into Omanyte and Kabuto, respectively. Kabuto, or Kabuto, means helmet in Japanese, and this is one of the many Pokemon that has the same name in both English and Japanese, along with the likes of Mew and Pikachu. So you come across Team Rocket a bunch of times throughout the game. They have a hideout in the Celadon City game corner, which is where you can gamble to earn coins to buy Pokemon and other prizes like TMs. TMs, or technical machines, are items you use to teach new moves to your Pokemon. You find them throughout the game and also get them each time you defeat a gym leader. There's also HMs, which are similar to TMs, except once you teach an HM move to a Pokemon, that move can't be forgotten. It's kind of annoying, but also requires some thought on the part of the player. So Team Rocket runs the game corner in a similar fashion to how pachinko parlors are run in Japan. It's illegal to exchange pachinko balls for cash directly in these establishments, but proprietors have found a loophole by setting up separate buildings where players go to trade the balls for cash. These games give lots of little nods like this to real Japanese society that most people outside of Japan would never have noticed. When I was a kid, I didn't even realize that the currency used in the game was yen. I thought it was just some made-up money for the world of Pokemon. So you defeat the Rocket's boss, Giovanni, in the hideout and collect the Sylph Scope, which allows you to see ghost-type Pokemon that were previously unidentifiable. After this, you head to the Pokemon Tower in Lavender Town, which is full of ghosts and channelers who've been possessed by evil spirits. After clearing Team Rocket out of the tower and saving an old man, you receive the Poke Flute, which allows you to wake up Snorlax, another fan favorite. Everyone loves Snorlax. He's kind of like the big Totoro, large and sleepy. He's one of those must-catch Pokemon, so make sure to save your game before waking up a Snorlax. Later in the game, you'll foil Team Rocket's plans once more. They've taken over a company called Sylph, which has been working on a new Pokeball with a 100% success rate called the Master Ball. You defeat a bunch of Team Rocket grunts and scientists, and eventually fight old Giovanni again. After rescuing the president of Sylph, you receive the Master Ball, which you should save until you encounter Mewtwo later on. There isn't really that much talk about Mewtwo in the game until you get to Cinnabar Island. Here you'll find the Pokemon Mansion, which is full of journals documenting the creation and subsequent escape of Mewtwo. It's actually kind of scary to me now. This part of the game is a bit haunting. We need to be careful when we're playing God and trying to create life artificially. Cinnabar Island is essentially one big research center. As well as the Pokemon Mansion, there's also a lab where they're bringing extinct species back to life. This is where you bring the fossil you found in Mount Moon to have scientists revive the ancient Pokemon. Kind of like the people working to bring woolly mammoths back to life. So Mewtwo is found in a cave just west of Cerulean City, home of Misty, the water type gym leader, or Kasumi as she's known in Japanese. So as is the case with the legendary birds, just make sure to save your game before initiating a battle with Mewtwo. If you fail to catch them, you'll never have another chance, and you'll need to acquire them via trade or something. That would be a monstrous deal, though. You'd have to give up a ton of draft capital to get a franchise player like a level 70 Mewtwo in his prime. Speaking of the legendary birds, there are three of them. The ice-type Articuno is found in a cave on the Seafoam Islands south of Fuchsia City. Zapdos, the electric type, is found east of Cerulean City in the power plant. 
The power plant is a pretty cool place, actually. It's uh, hidden away, and you feel like you've uncovered some great mystery when you first get there. Moltres, who is basically a phoenix, is found in Victory Road, right before you get to the Elite Four. All three legendary birds are at level 50 when you find them. Articuno and Zapdos are both kind of off the beaten path, and Moltres is the only one in an area that is necessary to go to in order to become the Pokemon champion. So that's how you get Mewtwo and the birds, but how about Mew? So you can get the 151st Pokemon using a Game Shark, but there's also a glitch that results in a Mew encounter. It's a little complicated to describe without visuals, but basically you allow a trainer to see you and then use Fly in the moment before they're able to engage in battle with you. There's more to it than that, but that's kind of the gist of it. Another little trick a lot of you probably know is the Missing No glitch. I remember when I first heard about this one, back in the good old days when things just spread by word of mouth. Then the sun set on the oral tradition for a few years before we all fell in love with podcasts and re-entered the golden age of radio. Anyway, the Missing No glitch allows you to catch some Pokemon off the east coast of Cinnabar Island that would normally not be there. It actually increases the quantity of the sixth item in your inventory as well, so if you place the Master Ball in that position, you can catch any Pokemon you encounter. Putting a rare candy in the sixth position in your bag is also a good tactic for cheating your way into getting some high-level Pokemon. Rare candy, of course, being an item that increases a Pokemon's level by one. There are a bunch of lesser-known glitches in the games as well, but Mew and Missing No are the big two. So the Pokemon anime was released just weeks before the games in North America in September of 1998. It didn't take long for both the anime and the games to blow up worldwide. There were a few differences between the two, including character design and the Pokemon used by certain gym leaders. In order to bridge the gap between the two, Pokemon Yellow was released in Japan in 1998 and North America in 1999. In this game, you start with Pikachu, just as Ash does in the anime, and your rival Gary starts with Eevee. You can't evolve your Pikachu in this game, just as Ash didn't evolve his in the anime. You can also find all three of the starters from Red and Blue in the game, which was really exciting at the time. There was tons of hype around this, and it was actually the main reason I wanted the game. So we've talked about the games and touched on the anime a little bit, but there have also been over 100 manga adaptations of Pokemon, the most famous of which is probably Pokemon Special, known internationally as Pokemon Adventures. The manga tends to be a bit darker, with Pokemon actually killing each other and even putting humans in danger at times. Some of the gym leaders, such as Lieutenant Surge, Koga, and Sabrina, are members of Team Rocket in the manga, so they're actually evil, and this raises the stakes a little. The manga gets deeper into the story too, especially the darker side of things. Organized crime and mad scientists experimenting on Pokemon. It's more like the real world. Contrast this with the games where Pokemon don't die in battle, they faint. All that being said, the games are still the best thing the Pokemon franchise has to offer. Of course, Pokemon cards were also huge, I mostly like them for the art and just as a collectible. I didn't really play the card game very much, but I still have a few of my old cards and they're just really nostalgic reminders of the past. So after collecting all of the gym badges in Pokemon Red or Blue, you can enter the Pokemon League and fight the Elite Four. As you'd expect, these battles are a bit more difficult than what you've previously encountered, but it's still not overly hard to beat them. Lance, the final member of the Elite Four, is a dragon-type trainer, and you don't really face many dragons throughout the game, so it's difficult to know what moves are effective against them. I'm pretty sure the first time I made it to the Elite Four, I didn't know that ice was their weakness, not unlike tennis star Andre Agassi. So once you get through the Elite Four, you find out that Gary actually beat them before you did. So in order to become champion, you have to defeat your old rival one last time. I actually really hated Gary, and 
Every time I faced him, I wanted to absolutely destroy the guy. I don't know why, they just made him really hateable, which is what you want in a video game rival, right? So Gary's Pokemon are all in the high 50s to mid 60s in terms of level. So you probably want yours to be around that if you're going to beat him. Gary's also one of the only trainers you face who has a well-rounded team. He has a good mix of Pokemon types, which should be something similar to what you have. In a way, you're fighting a mirror image of yourself. Someone who came from the same town as you, with the same goal, the same dream. Though supposedly he doesn't care about his Pokemon. They're just implements of battle for him. Whereas to you, they're meant to be friends as well. So train your favorite Pokemon, not just the ones that are the strongest. That's my advice to all you youngsters heading out on your quest to be a Pokemon master. Anyway, throughout this whole episode, there's been one question in the back of my head. How was Satoshi Tajiri able to wrap us up in the world of Pokemon the way he did? Well, he obviously had a great concept to start off with. Collect a bunch of cool animals and have them do battle with each other. There was also a lot of intentionality in his process, too. Everything was done for a reason. He made this game for the Game Boy so it could be portable. He wanted it to have a social aspect, and he wanted to build a world that we truly care about. You have no idea how much I wanted Pokemon to be real when I was a kid. Actually, you probably do, because you most likely had the same thought. You really go on a journey when you play these games, and the Pokemon you see and catch along the way are like the photos you take on a trip. The game is an adventure, but you also take it with you on your adventures through the real world. I remember going on trips when I was a kid and bringing my Game Boy with me for the long drive. No wonder these games have such a special place in my heart now. And Pokemon is one of the games I played the most in my life, along with maybe Zelda and Mario. It was a game that defined a certain generation, and it's one of the true triumphs of the Heisei era in Japan. I've barely scratched the surface today, so look out for more Pokemon episodes in the future. I hope you enjoyed it, whether you played the games or not. Now, stay tuned for today's bonus topic. So, seeing as the Pokemon games were inspired by Tajiri-san's love of bugs, I thought we'd take a look at some of the creepy crawlers you can find in Japan. We'll start off with a real fan favorite, the so-called murder hornet. The Japanese giant hornet is the largest species of hornet in the world. They have a pretty wide range and are found from Southeast Asia all the way up to Eastern Russia. And you might remember a couple years ago there were some sightings in the Pacific Northwest of North America. That was a pretty fun news story, killer bees invading from across the ocean. Now, a single sting is very unlikely to kill you, but if you get swarmed, you could be in serious danger. Giant hornets actually kill dozens of people each year in Japan. Now, let's talk about spiders, specifically the Joro spider. While they look intimidating with their black and gold and leg spans up to 10 centimeters, the Joro actually doesn't pose much of a threat to humans. They can bite and they do have venom, but not enough to kill or anything like that. They're featured prominently in Japanese folklore and have even inspired yokai of the same name. Jorogumo, which is a spider that can transform into a beautiful woman. Just be careful when you're strolling through a Japanese forest as these spiders create huge webs that can be up to 3 meters in diameter. The next bug on our list also appears in Japanese folklore as one of the most evil and foul creatures to ever roam the earth. That's a bit rude, actually. We should love and respect all creatures. But the Japanese mukade, or giant centipede, is pretty terrifying. They can get longer than a $5 foot long, and they have a painful venomous bite. So steer clear of these beasts if possible. All right, I think I have to mention the Japanese cockroach, or gokiburi, as you're very likely to run into these if you're in Japan, whether in the city or the countryside. 
Not much to say about them, really. They're big, they're fast, they're gross, and they can fly. I heard a rumor that you shouldn't step on them to kill them, as the scent left behind will attract more of them. The best way to kill them is probably to buy some spray from the drugstore. I was actually surprised how easily I defeated them when I first tried this. So if you see them in your house, don't panic, just spray. Alright, let's talk about a nice bug now, the cicada. They might look a little ugly, like giant flies, but they're a symbol of summer, even more so in Japan than in other parts of the world. Japan has multiple species that make different sounds and come out at different times of the summer. There are so many, you'll actually see them crawling on trees. Anyway, you all know the beautiful and tragic story of the cicada, spending years underground before emerging to sing their nostalgic song, only to die a short time after. And for the final bug of the day, let's talk about the prized possession of any bug catcher, and the inspiration for the second generation Pokemon Heracross. Yes, I'm talking about the Kabutomushi, or Japanese rhinoceros beetle. These are just the coolest insects out. Big, shiny beetles who fight each other with the large horns that protrude from their heads. This is one bug I'd be happy to see, unlike a few of the others on the list. Anyway, Japan has some crazy bugs, and if you're there for any length of time, you'll probably encounter at least a couple of the ones we talked about today. That's it for bugs. Coming up next are weekly recommendations. So I was trying to think if I'd been to Satoshi Tajiri's hometown of Machida, but I don't think I have. I've been close though. I went to a retro vending machine museum near there and it was pretty cool. Especially if you're a fan of the Showa era, which you are. I know you are. Everyone is. It's a really unique place. It's located at an auto shop called Used Tire Mart Sagamihara Store. Um, so I, I, I guess you can get some hot udon out of a vending machine while you get a set of snow tires put on your car. The vending machine corner, as it's called, has tons of options. Just make sure you get there early if you want some udon, as it does sell out quickly. Some other options include hamburgers, gyoza, ramen, and all kinds of drinks. They've also got a little arcade with a bunch of different retro games. It really is a window into the past. It's kind of out of the way though, so if you don't have access to a car, you'll have to catch a bus or a cab or walk for 20 or 30 minutes. I'll leave a link in the description and you can find a route that makes sense for you. Alright, since that place is a bit out of the way, I'll throw in another recommendation that's a little easier to get to. I was trying to think what food people eat in Pokemon, and I feel like there's a lot of yoshoku, or Japanized Western food, such as omurais or tonkatsu. So I'm going to recommend an old school restaurant in Nakameguro called Kitchen Punch. This isn't fine dining, but this is homemade and it's authentic. This is Japanese soul food. Some fried shrimp, a little side of spaghetti, and a miso soup, and uh, a bowl of white rice. They're well known for their omurice, and while I'm sure you can find better ones in Tokyo, you won't find any that warm your heart the way a kitchen punch does. It's a perfect place to grab lunch after walking along the Meguro River, looking at cherry blossoms. So that's all. That's all for this episode. It was a fun little walk down memory lane, wasn't it? It's always a challenge covering such a popular game as Pokemon, and next week we're headed in pretty much the complete opposite direction when we talk about the northern Japanese rock band Bloodthirsty Butchers. Their name sounds pretty intense, but they're kind of a post-hardcore melodic punk band. Anyway, they're one of the best Japanese bands ever. So I'm looking forward to talking about them next time and maybe introducing some of you to them for the first time. But for now, this is Stephen TM signing off, and I'll see you next time for Bloodthirsty Butchers.